Do you hear that? <laughs> you got to listen very carefully to this one, Ben. That is the sound. Oh, yeah. You know what? Are you going to give me any clues or am I going to have to just guess that it's an ornate snail-eating snake? <gasps> oh, my God. Yeah. How did he do it? How did How I do, did it? do it? Well, you know I sent you that audio clip? No way, no That's way. That's what that is. <laughs> yeah. My any other business that, that was, was going to chain completely blow your mind. Yeah. Well, mate, credit. I where almost saved you. it for next time my frog call came up. I was oh, like, really? no, 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 yeah, no I'll forget. Resist. This is too big. This is too big. You might find out about it in the meantime. Well, we obviously both heard about it. I was going to give you clues. I was going to be like, mate, I don't want to be, you know, cruel or unkind yeah. and, trying, you know, trip you up because it's not a frog, which, you know, nine times out of 10, 99 times out of 100, it's probably a frog. But this time, no, it was a snake. It was a snake. And indeed. I'm so sorry indeed. I ruined your big surprise. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm sorry. I, you sent me a nice audio file before the recording. We were all excited to listen to it later and I've ruined that. Yep. So, yeah. That's done. Well, <laughs> Well, great minds think alike. I guess we can say that. And you're right. It is the ornate snail eating a snake, Dipsas catesbii. So this is a snake. This individual was recorded. Ooh, why did I start that sentence? Was it in Belize? I uh, think Brazil. So Brazil, I think. Ah, uh, beginning with a B. Yeah, northern Brazil. And yeah, this is a recording. You know, this paper came out. I think this week. First record of a snake call in South America, the unusual sound of an ornate snail eater, Dipsas catespii, and that is the sound that you heard, that little squeak. Essentially, some herpetologists are in the jungle, and there's a little slug-eating snake, which is really cool snake. Um, super, super slender, massive head, big bulbous yeah, eyes really in there, big, one of the ones. Yeah, eyes. <laughs> yeah, snail eater. I don't know if I said slug eater just now, but they're a snail eater, and they have the specialized jaw that kind of hooks into the snail and scoops it out, something which... I've actually never managed to do in the times I've attempted to eat snails. Um, well, you just tend to crunch them down in one go, you know, like popcorn. <laughs> I swallow most stuff whole these days. <laughs> <laughs> Don't have the time to chew. <laughs> but yeah, so um, that was the call. And, you know, supposedly the first time a, a snake's been recorded calling, calling distinct from hissing because calling has like tone, tones or something like that. I think there are some other snakes which have kind of been demonstrated to be using kind of vocalizations in the sort of strict sense, like king cobras when they growl. And I think bull snakes do it when they growl as well. But yeah, this is new for this sort of area, this group of snakes. There have been some detractors on Facebook and such saying that this is not the sound of a snake. I've seen a few people suggesting that saying it could be a frog instead, you know, that was accidentally recorded nearby while the snake was being played with. (laughs) <laughs> maybe i don't know yeah maybe the other thing is that um some people have suggested it sounds more like the snake has a respiratory infection and it's squeaking as a result of that okay also a possibility yep. however you know this i don't want to detract from it i think we do need to see some more i mean this seems relatively this easy to solve find some more snakes go go prod them yeah go prod right. them but either way, yeah, it, it is causing a real stir amongst the people who are interested in whether or not snakes make noise, uh, which we're obviously both tapped into as we both heard about this. But yeah, pretty cool. And like I say, really nice um, snail eating snake. They're like sort of black background, but then with like white bands and red in between the white, really skinny. And because their mouths are so weird, they don't really bite. If you were to pick one up, it's not really one of its defense mechanisms to try and bite you, which kind of makes them seem really sweet and innocent. <laughs> And squeaky. And squeaky. Apparently also squeaky. So there you go. But uh, yeah, pretty crazy. And yeah, I'm sorry I ruined your your little thing for later on. (laughs) I'm sorry that I ruined your whole setup and immediately knew what it was. Uh, That's quite all right. No, but yeah, you're winning. You're winning. So your experience of listening to that call has put you 3-2 ahead, mate. (laughs) All all (laughs) I had to do was have the paper open in front of me as I was hearing the call. Yeah, you got it though. You got it to species level. That's amazing. Still, you know, n- I can never take that away from you. <laughs> All right, let's move on to our main paper. Okay, so this is by McKnight, Serrano, Thompson, Ligon, 2023. They really do move in herds. Evidence of group living in an aquatic turtle 
published in Animal Behavior. And so, yeah, pretty awesome, this paper. Obviously, nod to Jurassic Park in the title, which we love. That's always, that's always going to, yeah, that's a winner. So this is a large, strictly aquatic and herbivorous turtle. So unlike most turtles, it's native to Belize. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's what you were getting. This was the Belize connection that we were getting picked up on. I got Belize Mm -hmm. on the brain. Yeah. Yeah. These are native to Belize, Central America as well. It's like Belize is Central America, but more broadly, they're in Belize, Mexico, Guatemala. And they're known as Central American river turtles. Uh, the scientific name is Dermatemis Maui, but in Belize, they're known as Hicates, or in Spanish, this is my favorite one, in Spanish, they call them Tortugo Blanco, the white turtle. They've got quite funny faces as well. They do have funny faces. The first picture that pops up when you Google one is one sort of being held upside down, grinning at the camera, and you're just like, why are you so cute? <laughs> <laughs> but they've got they are, they yeah, are. That, that sort they of shovel face. pig snout that pop up in aquatic turtles quite frequently. Yeah, and the males have a kind of white head, which makes them stand out yeah. a bit more. They also have white bellies, which I think is why they're called white turtles in Spanish. But this is a study about their social behaviour. So we don't know much about the social behaviour of turtles, I think it's fair to say. There is some evidence that they uh, socialise to some extent, but it's definitely something which we're kind of just scratching the surface of in terms of our understanding. But this is a species which has probably been seen doing more what you could consider social behavior than most Vot et al was a paper that was published and they reported a mass copulation event in which all the males in a captive population mated during a single night and while that could be a sort of artifact of captivity that is quite random of a thing for turtles to all be doing at once not something you'd generally expect to see and there's also evidence that they congregate. There's a study suggesting that in captivity, they congregate together and sort of hang around in close proximity to each other for no obvious reason. And they've also apparently seen turtles doing the same thing in the wild in Belize, despite not being their obvious cover. They're just kind of like sort of sitting around in groups. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like sort of relatable activity. But yeah, just turtles seemingly deliberately hanging out together. And the most telling evidence, I think, which they introduced here was that they asked a local resident at their study site in Belize about the turtles. And without any prompting, without anyone mentioning they were social, this person said, yeah, they're like herds of cows. Yeah. Aquatic cows. Hard shelled. Yeah. Pig nosed cows. And so they were tracking a bunch of these. Yeah. But like, yeah, river pigs. Yeah. And they were tracking a bunch of these turtles and they were using, what do they call it? They had a... It wasn't radio. No, it was an acoustic solution, was it not? It was like a... What was it? What's the actual name for it? Because... They called it a son. Wasn't it a... S- it was a big S. Yes. Hydrophone from Sonotronics. So it's a hydrophone. But the transmitters they were sticking onto the turtles make a sound that they can hear. Sonic transmitters. That's yeah. What- so exactly yeah. that. Yeah, so then what they would have to do is they were in little boats or canoes and they would go over the turtles and when they got right on top of them, the little thing they had would be making a really really loud noise so they'd know that the turtles were right below and then they'd record the location that way. So interesting way of tracking the turtles. I'm absolutely effective by the sounds of it. Yes, the, and the tricks doing... came when they had multiple turtles in the same location. It was hard to distinguish like precise location with multiples all in the same spot so there is like a a three meter accuracy limit which which they mentioned but i mean like three meters is pretty damn good oh yeah yeah that's not bad i mean if you can say they're within three meters of each other they're pretty close together yeah yeah they used these devices to keep track on the turtles and they also wanted to well the, the whole idea of this study was to try and see whether or not they were associating together more often than you would expect by random So, like, can they actually sort of say that the turtles aren't just sort of milling around at random? They are actually nearby to each other more often than you would expect. So they used simulations to do that. They compared simulated turtle movements with actual observed turtle movements. And that conclusively suggested that these turtles are associating together. Yeah, the idea with the simulations was basically to have a... So you have your start location that your real turtle was at... And then you sort of simulate all the places it could have gone 
if it was not following other turtles. So they're just sort of randomly assigning the next point based on how far the turtle could move and then so on and so forth. So you basically generate a turtle moving at random movement data set. Yeah, so it's where it could have gone at all these different times and you compare that to the real and you'd expect if they were being social, all those like differences from turtle A to turtle B in the simulated data set would be a value. But in the real data, that value you would expect to be less because they should be staying closer together over that period, same period of time. I've explained and that in any remotely sensible way. Yes, and but what's the headline? Were they? Were they staying together more often than random? It certainly seems the case. And it certainly seems to be the case that not only were they staying closer to each other than the random simulated data set, that it seemed to be the case regardless of cluster size. Because you could have pairs, so you could have three turtles, four turtles, five turtles, six turtles. The sort of five, six turtle clustering was harder for them to look at because they didn't get as many examples in the data set at that. So that's still a bit of a question. It's still open to a bit of a bit more research. But certainly the smaller clusters, what they observed more frequently, it's looking like they do sort of hang out together. Or certainly stay closer than random. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. And so, you know, these we got these turtles which appear to be socialising, you could say, hanging around together. But that does beg the question of why these turtles might do it. How is it beneficial to the turtle? What are they gaining out of this social experience that they seem to be undergoing? The first and kind of most obvious thing, I guess, would be that it dilutes the likelihood of being eaten by a predator. So this is like known to be a social... Safety and numbers sort of behaviour. Exactly, a safety and numbers thing. So there's these more or less crocodiles, local and very common at the study site. The authors of this paper often find turtles which have been mauled by crocodiles and... So, you know, if you imagine you're going to be attacked by a crocodile, if you stand sort of nearer to your mate, it's kind of likelier that the crocodile might go for them or maybe can't pick a target. It's not yeah. quite so easy for the crocodile. Well, and you've got twice so as many good reason. eyes looking out for an approaching crocodile as well. Exactly, yeah. So there's no one, it's time to scarper. Alternatively, now these turtles are strictly herbivorous. They only eat vegetation. And apparently they graze on plants which are kind of like growing on the edge of the water as well, yeah. which is crazy. Like they're grazing on plants out of the water. But because of this, they're thought to have quite a unique microbiome in their gut, which helps them digest plant matter. And sociality, so animals hanging around together, can be beneficial because it allows them to exchange bacteria that's good in terms of their gut microbiome. And so it's and there are also even links between certain elements of the microbiome, like certain gut bacteria and an increase in sociality so it can also be a driver of sociality if you have a particular bacteria in your gut and so this kind of bacterial exchange has been proposed as like a plausible reason why they might be socializing although it hasn't been tested really but one thing the authors of this paper note which could suggest that this might have an impact is that the water surface in areas where these cities are actually congregating tends to end up being pretty gross and kind of covered in poo because they poo and then their poos flow up and then they end up just surrounded by this like localized sea of small turds lovely and um yeah apparently that could be a really good way of them sharing bacteria i mean it's it sounds it it sounds like a a, a positive <laughs> bacterial disaster a biohazard <laughs> It doesn't sound how I want to live, but I'm not going to judge them because... <laughs> I will. They're different. They're turtles. I'll judge them on your behalf. One drawback of these sort of like localised areas where there's a lot of faeces floating around is that it is really easy to tell when you find a, a patch of turtles because you can just see all their turds floating on top. And also, apparently, you can tell they've been there because they nibble the leaves on the edge of the waterway. So yes. if you're a human, it's pretty easy to suss out where these turtles are which has been to the detriment of the turtles because they have been poached in quite large numbers. And the authors of this paper actually think they had a couple of their study organisms poached during the study because some poachers came and they took a bunch of turtles. Local people told them it was like, you know, like double figures turtles, definitely. And a couple apparently had transmitters on them. But they think that 
part of the reason that happened is because the poachers were easily able to find lots of turtles because they hang around in groups yep. and also they have these like visible symptoms that they're there. So um, yeah, kind of a potential drawback for this social behavior. But yeah, fascinating to see that they one, are. Sorry, one other thing which, which they mention in the paper is you, I'm sure people are thinking, well, what if they're liking eating these leaves? Are they just all gathering towards prime areas of delicious leaf or delicious sort of prime resource maybe it's good shelter or good good whatever no they don't bask right they say they don't bask so the basking things out the out of the way where they did this analysis where they did this little study was in a stretch of river that didn't have any sort of good suitable resources for them it was a sort of silty muddy bottom with no real productivity that would encourage the turtles into it so it seemed like turtles in this area were in this area for other reasons than foraging and therefore the clusters they saw were not due to concentrations of high quality food or some sort of habitat feature they do sort of say they had no way of measuring like water chemistry and things like that but i kind of feel like that's kind of a a long shot that they were all gathering together in the same spot because of water chemistry and they Mm. do mention that that sort of would be less likely to account for when they had pairs of them moving together as well. Because if it was this like hot spot of some particular water characteristic, potentially you wouldn't get that sort of movement together because they could just be there whenever and then be done when they're done. So, yeah. Mm. I love the way that they uh, proved to everyone that the bottom of the river that they were in was kind of featureless by going swimming using sonar and printing out some like insane like bathymetry images of the bottom of this river yeah. all the way along its stretch. I was like, okay, cool. Like we we believe you. There's no sticks, right? <laughs> <laughs> the turtles hate it now. Yeah, though. yeah, yeah. Joking aside, though, that excellent. was really really cool. And yeah, I found that yeah, I really like to be able to see that full interior of a river so it's not really an opportunity you get that often i'm gonna play my soundbite again they do move in herds did you hear it last time <laughs> i did <laughs> I hear it last across, time it didn't come through across super reason. quiet and i was like he's not noticed that yeah so uh, uh yeah great title we love a little nod to yeah. it for jurassic park interesting and paper too it's, it's the same it's one yeah, of those ones think... that prompt almost more questions than it answers but oh boy does it uh does it make you think it's very intriguing yeah i'm sure this isn't the tip of the iceberg for total social behavior which is uh good i'm all for it i want to find out what they're up to have you got any other business for this week ben well i did there was this oh, wonderful yeah. sound being made from a small cute snake in uh, south america but that's been done. Again? let's hear it again just just why not oh a little squeak <laughs> there we go you could very easily miss that. It's a very, very subtle squeak. <laughs> from a subtle snake. Well, I've got a couple of pieces of any other business. So we had an email from Christopher who said, oh yeah, do you remember I was talking about the bitterling, the fish that was laying its eggs inside the mussel, the small bivalve? Oh yeah, your weird fish chat. Yeah. <laughs> you you loved it. I mean, it was, anyway, it so, was um, neat, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I was basically banging on about how the bitterling tricks the mussel into taking on its young and raising them inside it the bitterling lays eggs inside the mussel with a special ovipositor a long hose leading down and it lays the eggs in there and then the male comes along and sprays milk all over the mussel mm-hmm. and it like you know yep. absorbs yeah, it's it through. Um, yep. anyway so i was like saying how you know it's kind of pretty unfair on the mussel and a little bit of a sort of well it's just sort of seemed like a, a relationship which was very one way well as it turns out i'd misconstrued it because it turns out that it's a two-way parasitic relationship so maybe that makes it a bit more i don't know a bit more symbiotic a bit more mutual yeah potential but i don't know if i think both of them are hindered by the presence of what's going on so i think it's more just like there's there's just (laughs) mutual pain attacking both ways yeah but actually the freshwater mussels when they have their larvae they spray them out at unsuspecting fish and they latch on inside the gills and live inside the gills of fish or on the skin and they're a parasite there so actually <gasps> so not they only just the swap fish... they just throw stuff into each other's gills yeah and this christopher actually mentioned something called a muscle mantle lure which i didn't i was not aware of but a lot of mussels have lures which look like little struggling fish and then when a bigger fish comes in 
to investigate and they just spray them with larvae. Wow. And then they just, yeah, incredible. Like a whole world down there that we didn't know about. So bizarre. I love it. Thank you, Christopher, for fleshing out the interactions between these bitterling fish and these small freshwater mussels. We also had a correction from uh, Huellen who said, oh yeah, a few episodes ago now we were talking about speciation due to changes in geography, you know, like brought about by... Oh, the word. Yeah. So the word is vicariance. Vicariance. I said something begin with a V, but I don't think it was that. Yeah. So yeah, shouts to Huellen oh, for I that knew- word. Thank you. I knew someone would know. With my yeah. botched description of what I was trying to say. Excellent. Yeah. We were talking about the ring cows, which probably diverged because of changes in climate. Yeah. And so the word for that is vicariant. Vicariant. Cool. Excellent. I Excellent. think you said for vivariant. Vivariance is probably what I said, yeah. yeah. Which is probably yeah, not a yeah, word. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, that's it for any other business. Um, I've not got anything else. No, no, I, as I say, I've, I had my stuff and now it's done, so. Great, okay, cool. Well, in that case, uh, you can find us on social media. If you want to get in touch with us, if we got something wrong, like you did, the people who kindly uh, emailed in, Christopher and Llewellyn, thank you to you guys. But if anyone else has got corrections, let us know. Similarly, if you just want to ask a question, herphighlights at gmail.com is the address for that. Shout out to all our patrons at patreon.com slash help highlights if you want to support the podcast. And yeah, thanks for listening. Yeah, thanks for listening. Bye.